Hi, everyone. I'm Dan McBride, and this is Spotlight Solo from the ABA's GP Solo Division, the Solo for Solo Small Firms General Practice Attorneys. And I'm really excited today because I get to uh, spend some time talking with a new friend, Miriam Jacobson from Pennsylvania. And Miriam is our first sort of uh, rear view mirror looking attorney, I think, really, because she's just wrapped up a, a, a very nice and long and glorious career, I think, doing um, real estate practice in Pennsylvania. So Miriam, welcome to, to uh, Spotlight Solo. Pleasure to be with you. How recently did you retire? I retired, I started retiring in February last year and had my petition for retirement status granted in May of last year. And having fun? I would be having more fun if I weren't constrained about travel, but yes. Yeah, I got it. Miriam, you were in a solo practice or a small firm practice? Uh, since 1987, it was a solo practice. Um, and. And how did you come to be in a solo practice? How did that happen for you? Okay. Out of law school, I started with a medium-sized firm in Philadelphia. And after about four and a half, five and a half years, I transitioned to being in-house counsel with a regional commercial bank. Then banks started gobbling up other banks. And in the course of that, I was losing the real estate focus of my practice. And I decided before I totally lost contacts with the real estate um, community, I would go out on my own. I did that in July of 1987. And then in October of 1987, there was a huge stock market crash, which had I had a crystal globe, I might not have considered going out on my own because that's really affected the real estate market. But luckily I didn't know that. So I just forged ahead. You, you know, you and I got a chance to talk a little bit about what we thought we were gonna do when we went to law school and what we it kind of ended up doing. So I like that you call it a crystal globe. I'm sort of, I'm looking at loving that right now. But you know, when I, when I went to law school, I was pretty sold on having a quiet life. I thought I was gonna just do, do uh, transaction work and just do contracts and I got an externship doing contracts and and then I don't I don't know but here I am now you know divorce attorney to all the stars in New Mexico so here I am you know doing family law and you also had sort of a turnaround in law school do you want to tell me about that well, uh, I had dropped out of college after one year and worked for 13 years in various different industries and areas. And I had worked for several law firms, including some divorce law firms. And I thought I could run rings around these guys and they were doing terrible jobs for their female clients. So I wanted specifically to represent women clients in divorces. And that is why I went back to school to get my BA and go to law school. Well, I realized women clients generally did not have money. And when did all of the crises come up? Weekends and holidays. Also, the course that most appealed to me in law school was real property. And through luck, when I landed in my first job with a law firm after law school, it was the real estate department of that law firm. And I really liked what I was doing. You're sort of talking about a time when, when women maybe didn't even have their own name on a credit card and they, they, they might not have their own uh, sort of access to other kinds of capital that, that clients today might have. You know, I just had a meeting this week with people who were doing um, lending for litigation. And I'm sure that that wasn't, as, that wasn't at all available. Not only that, but I had been working for a bank, working with the lending officers who really liked me as their lawyer. And yet when I talked to them about getting a line of credit to open my law office, and I had represented them, they were my clients in the bank, and I had done loans for their customers who were young lawyers, male lawyers, opening up law offices. They said to me, oh, we can't lend to you. You don't have any track record. 
I had to go to another bank to get a line of credit to open my law firm. Oh my gosh. Wow. You know, I think so many of us today uh, just take for granted that we're lawyers and we can go and get a line of credit and establish a line of credit and it doesn't really matter. And so, you know, the majority of students in law schools now are women, um, but it sounds like a really different time. I don't know how much that's true because I've done a lot of networking. Um, in fact, when I was first with, with my first law firm, I started meeting women at closings, real estate closings, and I collected their cards. And then I started having a monthly meeting of women real estate attorneys. And the men in my law office would say, oh, Miriam's going out to her little girl's lunch group. Of course, when they did it, it was networking. When I did it, it was little girl's lunch group. Yeah. Um, but I developed a group of 80 some lawyers, women lawyers over the course of four years with that law firm. And it formed the basis for a very large networking group. And I continued to have that group as long as I was able to send, you know, back then there was no email. As long as I could afford to send out letters to have this networking group. No. And over the course of years, I was mentoring younger women who were coming into law practice. And to my dismay, even 10 years ago, I heard women in the large law firms, it's not much better. Mm. I don't know about the credit side. Well, um, yeah, well, I think that's certainly something for us to all reflect on, really, is, you know, it, you know yeah, I think it's easy to, to, to self-congratulate and say, look at the great progress we've made. And I, and I actually do think that we have made a lot of progress, but that doesn't mean we've finished the journey, right, for sure. Well, and so, looking at recent Supreme Court, not to bring in politics, but looking at recent Supreme Court decisions, I don't know. Um, so you built up a um, you built up a little girls lunch group of about eighty plus people. Women. Um, that sounds <laughs> that sounds great. Um, how did that serve you when you were ready to start your own firm? Were you able to tap into that network yourself? That was my support group. Some of them. I mean, I formed friendships and mentorships and networking that I kept up through the years. Um, most of those, well, some of those women have become judges, business owners outside of the law. Um, and they were people that I turned to when I had questions, whether it was practice oriented or otherwise. Miriam, so I'm wondering about the big changes that you saw as a practitioner. You know, when you started your practice in 1987, it was a very different world than 2021, technology changes and, you know, just social changes. How did you see in, in sort of big arcs, how did you see your, your practice change in that time? Well, actually, I was a technology enthusiast from 1984 on, because one, law firm that I was with had a couple partners who had um, Apple clones. And they would go home at night and play with spreadsheets and come in in the morning and compare what they had done. Now, I never heard of spreadsheets, but I was fascinated by what they were talking about. And my husband, my late husband, was a writer, a freelance writer. And I just loved the idea of these personal computers. And I said, David, we have to get one of those. You could use it. I would not have been able to open my practice had we not had a personal computer. So I was into it from pre-DOS days. And I was opening the box and flipping dip switches and I went through it from pre-DOS to DOS to Windows and every iteration since then. I was my IT guy. It is interesting how it's sort of art. I'm remembering for me in 1980, around 1984 or so, I worked for an insurance company and I was a, I was a typist. I, I was a customer service clerk, I guess. And uh, I found a little old computer and a dot matrix printer in a closet and I pulled them out and I, 
I created little templates of letters, you know, that we were sending clients and I found some three part carbonless paper, you know, and generated my letters. My supervisor went to my, uh, and I took my typewriter off my desk. My supervisor came to my office on Monday morning, got the typewriter back and put the typewriter on my desk and said, you have to use this typewriter. That is how we do this job. Uh, you know, uh, it's a different world. It's a totally different yeah. world. Yeah. Um, what are some of the things that you feel were your big, your sort of your successes as a small firm, a solo uh, practitioner? Well, one of the things that saved my life early on was the failure of savings and loans, ironically, because when the savings and loans tanked in the late 80s, um, the Office of Thrift and something set up a thing called Resolution Trust Corporation. I think it was the Office of Thrift Management. Right. And mm -hmm. Resolution Trust Corporation was mandated to contract with minority and women-owned businesses. And in the course of administering savings and loans, failed savings and loans in the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, they had to contract with law firms. And for Pennsylvania, I was the law firm that was selected. And that carried me for about three years. So that was a nice piece of change. I mean, it didn't make me rich, but it, during a very bad economic period, it kept me living. Right. Yeah. Hey, you know, one question I always like to ask everybody uh, on these interviews is really about what made it um, what made it really good for them as a solo practitioner? Why they liked working for themselves? So I'm going to ask you to finish the question that I I ask everyone. I liked working for me because I liked working for me because number one control. I liked being able to direct myself in what I could accept, what I could reject and making decisions about every single thing about my business. I, I see in my own life that, uh, you know, I'm often here late. I'm working long hours. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I, I sometimes feel that I'm by myself, but I remind myself that I'm part of a network of people in my state. I'm a part of my state bar organization. Nationally, I'm a part of the ABA's GP solo division. And uh, I like to say, we're the largest law firm, you know, in New Mexico, or we're the largest law law firm in America or the world, if we all pull together and we work together and help each other out. So um, I really appreciate you taking some time to talk with me today. Uh, is there anything you want to say before we wrap up today? Anything that's burning for you? Well, I think that everything that we do in our lives is of value. From my first position in life as a file clerk, to every job that I've held in every industry, to everything that I've done as a lawyer, all of those experiences have brought value to me. I've brought value to them and they've made me what I am. And I try to give back. Thank you. I think those are wonderful words uh, for us to take away. Hey, everybody, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes here at GP Solo. This is Spotlight Solo. I'm Dean McBride with my guest, Miriam Jacobson, and I hope that you have a fantastic practice.